the new clothes show magazine, the magazine to be seen with. In the December issue, those birds of a feather get all dressed up. Selena gives you some of her top beauty tips, and Simon Mayo reveals what's in his wardrobe. All that glitters, some solutions for Christmas party outfits from the high street. There's a great selection of little black dresses and the good leather jacket guide. Win a haircut in Hollywood and sample a brand new perfume. Get ready to party with the December Clothes Show magazine, out now. The man your mother warned you about is preparing to take BBC Two viewers by surprise, the wickedly entertaining Harry Enfield. And our comedy in half an hour is One Foot in the Grave. And that's after the nine o'clock news now on BBC One with Michael Burke. Mrs Thatcher fights back. She says she'll be staying in Downing Street and claims Mr Heseltine's plans would mean huge tax increases. He's heckled by demonstrators tonight but says, you'll not shout me down. Good evening. The battle for the leadership of the Conservative Party began in earnest today with Mrs Thatcher insisting she would still be Prime Minister after next week's contest. Nominations closed at midday with Michael Heseltine, as expected, her only challenger. In the Commons, during what in theory could be her last Prime Minister's question time, Mrs Thatcher said his plans for changing the poll tax would mean huge increases in income tax. While the leadership campaign hotted up, Mrs Thatcher concentrated on being Prime Ministerial, discussing South Africa with Chief Butelezi. She's been advised to fight Michael Heseltine by playing to her advantage, that she is the reigning champion. There was a planning session with her campaign team over drinks last night, but after a weekend at Chequers, she'll be in Paris for the security conference on Monday and will have bilateral talks with Presidents Bush and Gorbachev which may impress some waverers. In the Commons, a complaint about the noise brought a shout from Dennis Skinner. This suggestion tickled Mrs Thatcher's fancy. Not for the first time she recognised Mr Skinner as some kind of ally. But Patty Ashdown quoted a five-year-old newspaper in which she said she'd retire in five years' time. Does she recall her words at that time in which she said, by then, I'll have been in power 11 and a half years. The time will have come for somebody else to carry the torch. What has changed her mind? Mr. Speaker, I confess that that wasn't the foremost thought in my mind at this present time. Not the foremost thought in my mind. After three general election victories, leading the only party with clear policies resolutely carried out, I intend to continue. The Thatcher counter-attack was on Michael Heseltine's most effective plank, a review of the poll tax. If all education costs were transferred to central government and the grant still left with local government, it would mean a huge increase in income tax, as my honourable friend has said, or a substantial reduction in monies available for other services, such as health uh, and pensions and defence uh, and law and order. The Cabinet earlier discussed their own poll tax review. There's now intense speculation whether any ministers, senior or junior, will fail to support Mrs Thatcher. Some think it dishonourable not to resign, but others stand on the secrecy of the ballot. In Downing Street, loyalty was the watchword. Do you think you could serve under Mr Heseltine? I'm quite happy to serve under the present Prime Minister will continue to do so with great pleasure. The nightmare scenario for many not-too-partisan Tories is that Michael Heseltine does well, but not well enough to force or persuade Mrs Thatcher to retire. One of her backers says most MPs are deciding their votes by their own electoral survival. Another sceptic claims the populist right is moving to Heseltine, but others are worried by his European and industrial policies. After his nomination paper was handed in, the proposer explained why he wanted a change. I think in the past two or three years, many people have been anxious about the direction of the party. And that is why I have proposed Michael, because I believe he is the person who will bring the North and the Midlands and those metropolitan inner city areas, which are so vital to the Conservative Party at the next general election. After next Tuesday, there will be another review of the way Conservatives elect their leader. Here we've got a set of rules. 
designed for use when the party's in opposition. I don't think that people who framed those rules ever envisaged that they'd be used in a situation like we have today, self-evidently. They're not designed for that. They're therefore not suited to it in every respect. And I think the more we use them, the more that becomes clear. This election and its aftermath become less predictable as the hours pass. Some MPs are genuinely undecided. Others are saying different things to representatives of the two candidates. A veteran critic of the Prime Minister says she'll be gone by Easter at the latest. Her supporters claim there won't even be a second ballot. Michael Heseltine has been speaking tonight to Conservative Party workers in Paisley in Scotland, who are preparing for two by-elections later this month. It's Mr Heseltine's first public meeting since he announced his challenge to Mrs Thatcher, but he was met by demonstrators. In coming to Scotland, Mr Heseltine knew he was taking a risk. The Conservatives are deeply unpopular here, and as a party, they're, if anything, more divided than at Westminster. So the first, and possibly the only, public meeting of his campaign was bound to be a difficult one. His reception included some welcome cheers from his supporters, and most of the boos were from political opponents outside the Conservative Party. And when they tried to disrupt his speech, his reaction was vintage Hesseltine. You will not shout me down. You will not silence me. You will never solve Scotland's problems. If your only contribution to the debate is a loud mouth and an empty mind. There were many disruptions in a speech littered with attacks on Labour. He accused them of a narrow appetite for power. But there was no mention of Mrs Thatcher or his leadership campaign. He spoke, though, of the unavoidable choices in politics. Whether to act in time decisively and with courage, or to drift in the hope that time or other people will sort out the continuing decay, whether one should confront challenges or run away from them. If anything, the disruptions worked to Mr Heseltine's advantage. They let him show his talents against a hostile opposition. And according to his supporters, Scotland demonstrates clearly his reasons for standing. The party's unpopularity here is put down to two things to the poll tax and Mrs Thatcher. Last month saw the biggest increase in unemployment for more than four years. The seasonally adjusted figure was up more than 32,000, with nearly 1,703,000 people out of work and claiming benefit. Tonight, the Bank of England warned that Britain's economic slowdown will be deeper and longer than expected. For the 260 staff at this brickworks, there's no doubting the recession. The works have closed and their jobs have gone. Today they show up in the unemployment figures, part of the sharpest rise in the jobless total for four and a half years. The building industry is badly affected by high interest rates. Those high interest rates have hit consumer demand generally, especially in the south where mortgages are biggest and the squeeze on incomes most severe. As a result, it's the southern regions which are now showing the biggest job losses. Unemployment's still falling in Scotland and Northern Ireland, but nationally there's no doubt the trend is getting worse. Since April, the number of people out of work has risen by nearly 100,000, and vacancies have been falling. There are now fewer jobs on offer at job centres than at any time in the past seven years. The government today repeated its warnings on pay. Recent deals have been edging well into double figures, especially in the car industry. The employment secretary said unemployment was likely to carry on rising. Pay restraint was vital to protect jobs. When people sit round a table and talk about pay, they should bear in mind the long-term consequences of their actions uh, and not act in such a way as to make their employer less competitive and put jobs at risk. Of course wages are a factor in the economy, but the reason why jobs are being lost at the moment is because of the recession that is here and now and deepening the very, very high interest rates, which are the result of mistakes of government economic policy over the past few years. Evidence from industry and from the high streets is that the recession is becoming more serious. This recession, however, is different from the last one. It's in the Tory heartland in the south of England that its impact is being felt most of all. And there was little comfort from the Bank of England's bulletin tonight. The banks worried about the Gulf crisis and its impact on world trade. All in all, it says Britain's slowdown will be steeper and more prolonged than previously thought. 
Iraq's information minister has been talking about the conservative leadership contest. Anyone, he said, is better than Mrs. Thatcher. She's a bad woman. Mrs. Thatcher's problems and the fading popularity of President Bush in the United States are encouraging the Iraqis. Our foreign affairs editor John Simpson, who's just returned from Iraq, says Saddam Hussein is convinced that the West won't go to war. Baghdad doesn't feel like a city facing the threat of war. Sanctions are having only a very limited effect, even though a new round of rationing has just been introduced and high prices are starting to cause serious hardship. But President Saddam Hussein's control is so tight on everything that no one is tempted to come out and challenge his authority or his government. The atmosphere in Baghdad is relaxed. There's little or no hostility to Westerners. And yet the apparent normality of everything is an obstacle to a clearer appreciation by Iraq of the dangers which surround the whole crisis. After Yevgeny Primakov, Mr. Gorbachev's Middle East envoy, last met the Iraqi leadership, he said privately that President Saddam Hussein had little idea of the determination of the United States and its allies to solve the Gulf crisis by force if necessary, nor did he appreciate how widespread was the hostility in the outside world to Iraq. Instead, President Saddam Hussein seems to believe he has plenty of time and that there's rising revulsion in the United States, Britain and the rest of the world against war. The drop in President Bush's popularity and the challenge to Mrs. Thatcher's leadership are interpreted as signs of opposition to their Gulf policy. The information minister, Latif Jassim, is gleeful at the moment about Mrs. Thatcher's difficulties. This is what he had to say about Michael Heseltine's challenge to her. I don't know anything about him, but anyone who come uh, 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 and, uh, instead of Thatcher, he's better than Thatcher. Thatcher is a bad woman. Thank you. The American refusal to say clearly whether there'll be war or peace may be confusing the Iraqi military planners, as it's no doubt intended to. But it also encourages President Saddam Hussein to believe that the Americans aren't serious about fighting. He, after all, is a man who says what he's going to do and then does it. And he seems to interpret President Bush's apparently contradictory statements as mere wimpishness. For instance, at the end of last month, Mr. Bush seemed to be thinking in terms of an attack. Appeasement leads only to further aggression and ultimately to war. And we are not going to make the mistake of appeasement again. Two days later, he was even tougher. The American flag is flying over the Kuwaiti embassy, and our people inside are being starved by a brutal dictator. And do you think I'm concerned about it? You're darn right I am. And what I'm going to do about it, let's just wait and see. Because I have had it with that kind of treatment of Americans. But the next day, they thought in Baghdad that he was backing off. We bear no hostility to the Iraqi people, nor do any of the other 25 countries represented on land and sea standing with us shoulder to shoulder in the Gulf. President Saddam Hussein believes he has the stronger will and the better cause. The greatest danger in the entire crisis, though, is that he'll think he's got more time than he actually has to make concessions, and that time could run out before he makes them. 22 Irish nurses who'd been forced to stay in Iraq are on their way home tonight. Their departure has raised hopes amongst other Western contract workers who can't get permission to leave. The nurses have been kept in Baghdad after their hospital contract ran out. They leave behind a hundred other hospital staff who still haven't been given permission to go. The RAF in the Gulf has a new commander. He's Air Vice Marshal Bill Ratton, who takes over from Air Vice Marshal Sandy Wilson. Today, both men dismissed suggestions that the leadership challenge to Mrs. Thatcher would have any effect on the forces in the Gulf. RAF tornadoes are now in their fourth month here, and if there were a question of morale, this would be the time point. Double time. Their air patrols are longer because of mid-air refueling, and their tour of duty has been extended from three months to six. But because they're flying operationally, the outgoing air commander says that's no problem. And of course, we've never known from minute to minute where there was going to be a conflict. Uh, we've been prepared for it, and happily it hasn't happened so far. One Air Vice Marshal was handing over to another, the command of the Air Force here, the deputy command of all British forces, and the task of dealing with some difficult questions. One he fielded for himself was the effect of the Conservative leadership contest on the morale of troops in the desert. Well, I think one of the 
one of the important things of this crisis is it's had bipartisan, bipartisan approach uh, across all three parties. I, I'm not a politician, but I can't believe that we, that we won't have a continuing policy regardless of what happens in England. And uh, certainly, as I understand it, we have the British public behind what we're doing. I don't think I've anything further to add to what M. Marshall Wilson has just said, quite frankly. I mean, the services are trained to follow whatever the political directive may be, and that's precisely what they'll do. The Conservative leadership issue is not exactly reverberating across the desert. And from the point of view of British servicemen on the ground, whatever may be claimed in Baghdad, there really doesn't seem to be much of a golf card to play. Martin Bell, BBC News, Saudi Arabia. The Archbishop of Canterbury has warned that war in the Gulf may be unavoidable, but in a speech to the Church of England Synod, Dr. Runsey also said that sanctions should be given up to a year to work. During the war, Dr. Runsey won the military cross for rescuing a comrade in arms from a burning tank. Today he was battling accusations that he and fellow bishops had failed to speak clearly on the Gulf crisis. He said romantic ideas of a surgical strike should be set aside. The reality was of women and children suffering the unspeakable horrors of mustard gas. In the light of this, the most sweeping sanctions of modern times should be given time to work. The sanctions must be given some further month. A year of sanctions would be far cheaper in every way than even a very short war. The speech was welcomed by the theologian Dr. Philip Crowe, who had created the controversy by calling for a clear stand from the bishops. He didn't say, pull out, but that's the implication of it, that we should simply have a defensive force there until we're clear that sanctions are not going to work. I don't think any of that will be welcome to the government, but it's a very welcome moral lead. But Dr. Runce's support for war as a last resort drew criticism from representatives of the hostage families. Some in the church would also have liked more peacemongering from the archbishop. It was a strong speech. On the other hand, I think some very sharp and even stronger speaking is needed if we're going to prevent a drift to war. Dr. Runcy was anxious to rebut criticism from within the church that the bishops have failed to give a moral lead on the Gulf crisis. But in doing so, he will have raised some eyebrows in the government where ministers are trying to talk tough on the Gulf. His comments follow those of Cardinal Hume, who last week gave a personal warning that in the volatile Middle East, intervention might cause damage greater than the original injustice. A major political row over prices is brewing in the Soviet Union. The Parliament of the Russian Republic, which is led by Boris Yeltsin, is defying instructions to lift price controls on luxury goods. Two more republics, Moldavia and Kazakhstan, have now followed suit. The mood of revolt in the Russian parliament has been building up for several weeks, coming to a head in a brazen act of defiance against the authority of Mikhail Gorbachev. Ironically, the items released from state price controls are luxury goods, which many Russian MPs agree should cost more. But the Russian parliament's rejection of the measures was sparked by the high-handed way they were announced, only days after Mr Gorbachev had met Boris Yeltsin to promise more consultation and cooperation. Their latest dispute resulting in a suspension of sales of furniture, electronic goods and jewellery throughout the Russian Republic. In an indication of the Kremlin's concern over the clash with its largest and most powerful republic, the president of the National Price Commission appeared on television today to try to calm emotions. We're taking these measures to beat the speculators, to normalise the market and to cut queues but we fear greed by retailers and we're appealing for restraint. This clash is the power struggle that many had feared, with Mr Gorbachev issuing a decree and Boris Yeltsin's Russian Republic simply refusing to obey it, a divisive confrontation that could undermine efforts to preserve the Soviet Union in its present form. Martin Sixsmith, BBC News, Moscow. European trade ministers have been trying to reach agreement on how to rescue the GATT talks on liberalising trade between Europe and the rest of the world. At a meeting in Brussels, the Trade and Industry Secretary, Peter Lilly, urged his European colleagues to be more flexible, particularly over farm subsidies. Britain's Trade Minister, Peter Lilly, came to Brussels today aware the GATT talks are close to failure. His colleagues from elsewhere in the community have already backed a scheme to cut farm subsidies by 30% after claims that they distort competition. But the ministers know the United States and others are demanding a reduction of 75%. An international trade war may be the result if a compromise can't be found. 
The new GATT treaty to remove trade barriers is due to be signed next month, but the row has brought talks to a virtual standstill. All imports and exports, not just agricultural, may face higher tariffs if a deal isn't done. But Peter Lilly says an agreement would boost British exports, especially from service industries. The Commission say in their view it would be possible to envisage a quadrupling, fourfold increase in trade and exports of services from the community. And Britain as a great exporter of services would stand to benefit most if we can get that sort of growth. The American Secretary of State, James Baker, will also visit Brussels tomorrow, part of a concerted diplomatic effort to save the talks, trying to narrow the differences with the community. He'll point out that more trade will lead to the creation of more wealth. The next 24 hours are crucial for the trade talks. The visit by Mr Baker, a sign that the Americans don't want them to fail. But his efforts and those of the European community negotiators will determine whether success is possible. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Brussels. Charges against two men accused in connection with the Iraqi supergun affair have been dropped. Peter Mitchell, the former managing director of a West Midlands engineering firm, and Dr Christopher Cowley, a metallurgist from Bristol, had been accused of breaking export regulations. Customs and excise officials say they don't anticipate charging anybody else. When customs men discovered the so-called Iraqi supergun on the docks at Teesside, the manufacturers claim the consignment was nothing more than steel piping bound for an Iraqi oil refinery. They produced this company video to prove the point, although the Before customs the and excise the say they're Final still convinced this is the barrel of a huge gun capable of lobbing shells as far as Israel. Since the Iran-Iraq war, military equipment sold to Iraq requires a special export license. Sheffield Forge Masters engineered the alleged supergun, and another engineering firm in the West Midlands arranged the contract. Both said export licenses had been granted after the documentation had been checked for civilian use. And there's now criticism that the customs men may have been overzealous. What I shall be taking up with Treasury ministers, and I've already given them notice of this, is whether there was an abuse of power in this case. In other words, whether the customs were using powers that were granted them for VAT purposes for other purposes. Following today's hearing, Customs said they believe their men did prevent a lethal weapon from reaching Iraq, although they had no evidence that the two accused knew anything about it. Desmond Ellis, who was extradited from the Irish Republic to Britain yesterday, has decided to give up his hunger strike from tomorrow. Mr Ellis is facing charges in connection with bombings in London eight years ago. His father said he'd responded to appeals from his family to call off his 37-day hunger strike. The chairman of the Burton Group, Sir Ralph Halpin, has resigned. He said it was time for a rest. He leaves with a golden handshake worth two million pounds. News of his departure came as the company announced a sharp fall in profits. 133 million pounds this year compared with 217 million last year. Down nearly 40%. Sir Ralph Halpern and fame, a knighthood and Britain's first million pound salary, building up the Burton Empire, owner of Debenhams and Topshop. Under Sir Ralph's guidance, the Burton Group has grown into one of the country's largest fashion chains. Because of his extravagant lifestyle and celebrated salary, Sir Ralph was never far from the headlines. But this sort of image wasn't popular with Burton's financial backers. When recession hit, Burton's dramatic profits growth first stalled, then collapsed. Today, the company announced a 40% fall in profits and Sir Ralph's opponents got what they wanted as the company's chairman and chief executive stepped down. Taking Ralph Halpern's place as chairman, Sir John Hoskins, left with the challenge of explaining why Burton's wanted to part company with the man who'd done so much to build its success. We are a much larger uh, organisation than when he came. We are perhaps a more mature organisation and therefore the general way in which the uh, business will be run will probably uh, inevitably change to reflect that. Sir Ralph is just the latest business star of the 80s to fall in the current economic squeeze. George Davis was ousted in a boardroom coup from Next, the fashion chain he'd masterminded. Sir Terence Conran resigned from storehouse the Habitat Group after profits began to fall while John Ashcroft left Collarol shortly before receivers were called in to his hugely indebted empire. Sir Ralph Halpern, at home in his London mansion this afternoon, may have retired, but he hasn't yet escaped controversy. 
He's being paid £2 million in a golden handshake and outstanding bonus payments, and that's on top of a pension of £450,000 a year. Air accident investigators are examining the wreckage of last night's plane crash in Switzerland in which 46 people died. One Briton was among them. He's been named as Martin Hodgson of Bath. The plane, an Alitalia DC-9, hit a hillside five miles short of Zurich Airport. It was about a thousand feet below the normal altitude when it crashed. The authorities say they've found one of the black box flight recorders, which should help pinpoint the cause of the crash. Secondary school pupils should work longer hours in the classroom, according to a report from the right-wing Centre for Policy Studies. The group says if they were taught for 30 hours a week instead of the present 24, it would raise educational standards. The school day at Ealing Green High is 8.45 to 3.15, giving pupils just over 23 hours of classes a week. That's fairly typical, with 70% of schools providing lessons for 24 hours a week or less. In Japan, they spend 35 or more hours in class and have shorter holidays. Over a year, Japanese pupils may have some 500 hours more teaching than their English counterparts. Here, the new city technology colleges have stretched the school day, many starting at 8 and finishing at 5. That way, they can offer both the national curriculum and extra emphasis on science and technology. The report's author says longer hours will raise standards. It must do, because over a period of five or six years of secondary school education, if you increase the number of hours by roughly a third, it's going to mean almost one to two years more education. Perhaps the biggest advantage to schools of a longer working week would be to make it easier to fit in all ten national curriculum subjects without having to lose others like economics, sociology or a second foreign language. But although it would ease timetable worries, many schools wouldn't welcome the extra burden on both staff and pupils. I think it's unrealistic to expect children to give that much time to, to, um, to the work that they have in school, both at school and at home, uh, and not have time for other things, like growing up, for example. Schools also point out that when pupils' homework and teachers' preparation time is taken into account, there isn't scope for many more hours in the classroom. Tonight's main news again. Mrs Thatcher has said that Michael Heseltine's plans would mean huge tax increases. And last month saw the sharpest rise in unemployment for over four years. There'll be more on Newsnight at 10.30 on BBC Two and on Breakfast News from 6.30 on BBC One. But that's all from the nine o'clock news. Good night. Michael Heseltine's challenge to the Prime Minister is the talk of our Question Time audience tonight here at Cambridge University. In just over an hour's time, they'll be questioning the Conservative Party Chairman Kenneth Baker and Labour's leading spokesman Gordon Brown, plus the ever-controversial Mary Whitehouse and the Bishop of Durham. Join us live from Cambridge, 1050, BBC One. Northwest Update with Phil Sayer. Good evening. Unions at the Vickers shipyard in Barrow have been told the company wants to shed up to 1,500 jobs next year. It's expected that most of the job losses, which will take place after April, will go through natural wastage. The exact details of the redundancy program aren't expected until the new year. By then, the government is expected to have specified its submarine requirements for the next decade. Thirteen people will appear before Preston magistrates tomorrow charged with conspiracy to defraud the post office. Seventeen people were arrested yesterday in a series of raids across the north of England and Scotland in connection with alleged state benefit frauds. Four of those arrested were released on bail without charge. Detectives in Liverpool are questioning a man following the discovery of the badly burnt body of 26-year-old Julie Ann Christian in an alleyway in Toxteth. The victim's keys, purse and one shoe are still missing. Police are appealing for witnesses. At Manchester Crown Court, 26-year-old Stephen Julian from Cheatham Hill has admitted attempting to murder a security guard during an armed robbery at the coin control factory at Royton in Oldham. 22-year-old Chinado Higuara, also of Cheatham Hill, pleaded guilty to wounding during the same attack. Both men will be sentenced tomorrow. Rochdale Council is drawing up an emergency action plan to implement child protection recommendations made by the Department of Health. 
The Director of Social Services, Gordon Littlemore, will present the plan to a special meeting of the Social Services Committee. Lancashire County Council has rejected plans to site a quarry in 240 acres of the Ribble Valley. The proposed site for the sand and gravel quarry was on agricultural land close to the M6 near Salmsbury in Preston. Finally, football, Peter Reid is the new manager of Manchester City. He replaces Howard Kendall, who's rejoined Everton. And that's it from us for now. There'll be more news on BBC One at 6.55 in the morning, and that's followed by regular updates throughout the day. Hello. A dull old, windy old day tomorrow. Cloud is building up in the west, and an active little wriggle will rush eastwards across the British Isles during tomorrow, packing those lines in a much windier day tomorrow than it has been today in most areas. Those fronts then sinking slowly southwards across the country, during the course of the weekend. But back to tonight, a little bit of drizzle in the west at the moment, many places dry. As we go through the night, rain quickly spreading eastwards across Northern Ireland, much of Scotland and into northwestern parts of England. Drizzle farther south, especially in the west, and becoming, becoming very misty in many places by the end of the night with lots of fog on the high ground. But it does mean a fairly mild night everywhere. A dull day tomorrow, lots of mist and fog, especially on the high ground in the west and some patches round the coast as well. Some quite heavy rain over Scotland, Northern Ireland and northwestern parts of England and some drizzle farther south as well. As we go through the morning, winds picking up over the country, that's going to have the effect of lifting the low cloud in central and eastern parts of England and Wales off, but it will stay fairly overcast even there. As we go through the afternoon, much brighter weather sweeping southwards across Scotland, brighter, cooler weather into Northern Ireland and into northern parts of England by the end of the afternoon. Farther south, staying dull, mild and drizzly, the drizzle especially in the west. A very windy day with those are the average wind speeds at midday tomorrow. Those winds even picking up on that during the course of the afternoon. Gale developing in many exposed western districts, perhaps even severe gales off northern parts of Ireland and southwestern parts of Scotland. But for most of us, another very mild day in the south, 15 Celsius, 59 degrees Fahrenheit, progressively colder as you get northwards. 13 in Belfast, 12 in Glasgow, just 8 in the northern Isles, 16 Celsius. Mild and drizzly in the south again, we think, on Saturday, bright in the north with some showers, that brighter weather, colder weather spreading southwards across the whole country on Sunday. And yes, the showers turn to snow over the northern hills. 40 minutes on BBC Two now is in the Quantock Hills in Somerset, where a battle is raging between established villagers who for generations have hunted deer and the newcomers who object to what they see as immoral and out of date. Friday night on One and Wogan's in Hollywood with Valerie Harper and voice of Roger Rabbit, Charles Fleischer. Then at 7.30, Del Boy fondly remembers his mother. Our mum was a wonderful woman. She had long, golden, blonde hair. Sometimes. <laughs> at 8, Bruce says... Nice to see you, to see you! <laughs> at 9.30, food for thought in Casualty. I reckon that sausage was off. At 10.20, the mythical green man is back as Omnibus explores the present-day relevance of this ancient and mysterious figure in the return of the green man. Then at 11.10, our late-night chiller, the phantom of the Rue Morgue. Help! Help! Police! Murder! A blood-curdling end to Friday night on BBC One. There are sleepless head nights ahead now on one for Victor and Margaret, who for the last time in the current series have one foot in the grave.